Why We Bleep is sponsored by Signal Sounds. I was walking through the market the other day when I came across a packet of tinfoil plates. You know, for when you have a barbecue and can't be bothered to do any washing up. And I thought, hmm, I could put these in a grid formation. Fashion metal drumsticks by wrapping chopsticks in tinfoil and so create an innovative electronic drum pad, just like my hero Wolfgang Fleur of Kraftwerk. It turned out that hooking up a car battery to my ill-conceived contraption only resulted in me receiving a rather profound loss of sensation in my fingers, and also my hands, forearms, arms in general, and really rest of body once the initial agony had subsided. And the sound, a far cry from the crisp boing boom shack of the boys from Dusseldorf, sounded like a car battery was being directly connected to the speakers, because I suppose that's really what it was. Yes, no, I think I am probably best to leave the Touchplate Electronics to signal sounds. They've got a whole swathe of professionally made touchy-feely contraptions in stock. Buchla music easels, Archeria Microfreak Stellar, that landscape stereo field, Bella Gliss modules, Neutral Labs Elmira 2, now in gorgeous Colgate White, or the Bonkers, error instruments, blind noise, and much more besides. Yes, rather unfortunately, the only part of my anatomy not affected by the accident was also the one that's apparently not acceptable to bang on a tinfoil plate in public. If you ask me, our local open mic night needs to be a bit more open-minded. So to enjoy touchblade electronics without having the police called on you, visit signalsounds.com. That's signalsounds.com. Why We Bleep is also sponsored by the rich premium synthesizer kits of thonk.co.uk. After a stressful day at work, I like to put on my smoking jacket, light up my soldering iron, and unfold a fresh packet of synthesizer kits from thonk. Smell that aroma? That's the smell of satisfaction. I've saved a pretty penny, whilst also building a modular synth that would make Hans Zimmer cry himself to bed at night. Thonk offer easy-to-follow and bang-up-to-date synthesizer kits, such as the new Bifaco Octus VCO, RYK modular kits like the M185, Knight Rider filter bank, and Vectorwave VCO. Not just everyday synth modules, but intoxicatingly cutting edge modular synthesis. And because I rolled my own, I saved a packet. So for high-quality packets of rich, aromatically premium synthesizer DIY kits... Don't you deserve a bit of thonk? Visit thonk.co.uk Warning! DIY synthesis is extremely addictive, but it's also really satisfying and saves you money. Why? Hi, welcome to Why We Bleep, and this time we present a conversation with none other than Jake Knight of RYK Modular. (laughs) Now this, I think, is actually an exclusive interview where we talk about the backstory, his life and his work, because you may or may not be aware, but Jake is not just the person who created the M185. This person has had a career working in film and advertising promo video creations. And Jake, alongside his partner, have directed videos that you may possibly have seen. I think probably the most famous thing, and something that we mentioned in the pod, is he and his partner directed a ad for Volkswagen where a bizarre um, mashup occurs where Singing in the Rain is recreated with Fred Astaire's body and face being visible. There's a Fred Astaire in the video, but he is performing body popping futuristic dance moves, which are clearly uh, filmed now. You know, this isn't the Fred Astaire that we knew, but it's got Fred Astaire's face. Now, the body 
was this guy called David Elsewhere. And David Elsewhere, you may or may not be aware of, but there's an absolutely amazing clip that did the rounds 14, 15 years ago of a young man dancing to Expo 2000 by Kraftwerk, performing these just insane sort of stop-start movements that make him look like human animation. (laughs) It's absolutely amazing. Things you did not know a body could do, David Elsewhere can do. And um, it's David Elsewhere in the video and the director, along with his partner, is Jake. Jake who created the M185. And this conversation, I think, is an opportunity to learn more about someone and learn how someone can just follow their passions throughout their entire life and you don't know what it could possibly lead to you know um which is to say this is all a very niche corner of the world that we live in in the world of like modular synths and whatnot but you know the fact is that that m185 you know the that little sequencer has got a lot of people excited about modulus. You know, I have met more than one person who said that the video that I made about the Metropolis, and in turn, you know, what is exciting in that video is the sequencer that Jake helped give birth to and then that Intelligel made en masse. You know, people have gotten into modular synthesis because of that video. It was the catalyst that made them think, oh my God, this is amazing. I need that. And in turn, I was inspired by Jake's video where he was just jamming and making the coolest electro that I'd heard, you know, with this super cool electro sequencer. And latterly, now we have uh, our friend James Blake. James Blake's latest record, Playing Robots Into Heaven. Uh, Well, that main riff on, like, Big Hammer. Is a Metropolix which in turn is is an M185-inspired sequencer. And so, you know, if you follow your passions, if you're passionate about music technology and you love it, love it, love it, and you follow it and follow it and follow it and you live and breathe it, and you're so passionate and curious and interested that you might even think, oh, I want to have a go at making a thing that could work with that. Why don't I just... I mean, I'm not going to ask for someone's permission. I'm just going to bloody do it. And I'm going to... You know, if I'm working in China, I might just walk through this. Let's go and see what parts we can find and see what's around and see what's cooking. And, oh, that's interesting. This this eight-way slide switch, I've never seen one of those before. And, oh, you know, I was watching a video on YMO and their sequencer and, oh, maybe I'll, I could use a switch and, and get rid of the monotony of, of, you know, step sequencers. And if you just are curious and follow your curiosity and indulge your passions, anything can happen. <laughs> you, can't, you can't know where it'll lead you. And it might feel like you're being indulgent or wasting your time. But I think that this conversation is a good example that you should definitely follow your passions. So, a conversation with a very interesting person and learning his backstory and history and how did he get into the whole weird video making thing and from the video thing to the music technology creator making gear in his corners of his flat. Let's find that out, shall we? And so I will talk to you later. Let's speak to Jake from RYK Modular. Thanks very much. just show me around your like manufacturing hub mm-hmm. at your the corner how would you introduce yourself to someone because you seem to straddle like so many different worlds you obviously have a professional sort of film side and then there is also clearly like a love of music technology then there's also a person who would actually make things which is they all seem like unrelated but are they uh no i think they all connect don't they i think uh, making or designing audio stuff when you're making music yourself that inspires features and ideas and things that you might want to put into a product. I went to art college, so I studied 
art and practice fine art. And so I think a visual sense also goes into the design and um, layout, I suppose, to a certain extent of modular things, which is obviously what I'm doing at the moment. Where are you from originally? Where's your, did you uh, grow Kent. Kent. I'm from Kent. Yeah. Yeah. Whereabouts in Kent? I don't know it that well. Uh, apparently now it's the clubbing capital of uh, Kent, which is Maidstone, well, which is, um, wasn't the clubbing capital of, of, of Kent when I was there. What was it like? Now? I had no idea. I like, mean, back I, then. Oh, I don't know. Uh, it's very conservative, right-wing, leaning, farmy, rich people. I couldn't wait to leave, to be honest. When did you leave? Uh, when I was 18. And where did you go? I was I 19. I went to Sheffield to study fine art. And you were, like, how long there? You just did you stay? Uh, I went early and stayed late, so it's probably about four years in all, I think. Mm. I mean, if I can ask, when was this? What was the <laughs> a long time ago? A long time. Yeah, no, it was a very long time ago because it was when um, techno came over from Detroit. Yeah, and of course Sheffield and Manchester and Leeds had this were the kind of places that were you know, playing that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's when Soul to Soul was London was all Soul to Soul and Leeds, Manchester, Sheffield was techno. So, yeah, it was, you can date it from then, I'm sure. Yeah. Like, I mean, we're talking... It's uh, when Warp Records started. I yeah. mean, we were there when Warp started up. I started video art, so me and my contemporaries at the time would hassle Steve and Rob constantly about making videos because, of course, they had no money, so they couldn't even dream about doing that at the time. But D- that was, Did you make any videos for them? Or do uh, I did. I worked on a very, very old um, video compilation called Artificial Intelligence. Yes, which is like very old. It was on VHS. It was on VHS, yeah. yeah. Remember that. What did you do for them? What was it? Uh, I did a Speedy J video with David Slade, who is a director who's um, someone I was at college with. So he ended up directing lots of music videos. He did, I think he did an Aphex one and loads of guitar bands and famous people. What was the video? Do you remember? The Aphex one. He did Donkey Rhubarb, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which is with the, the Dancing Bears. Yeah, yeah, that's the Inside one. Insight, seminal. But what was your one for Speedy J? Uh, it was for the artificial intelligence. So it was all CGI. So the idea was they were just wanted to do CGI everything. So we did this sort of weird, sort of revolting or, or organic squidgy things that do weird stuff in a organic squidgy environment. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like you've you seen that like modern aesthetic of the kind of vintage crap CG. You know that you're getting these kind of. There's this like wave of CG things that are happening now where they look... Oh, the chrome balls, yeah. Yeah, they look yeah. like old, terrible CG. And quite well, that sp- video is mostly like that, apart from... I suppose there was one guy who did most of the videos. He was really into that at the time, and that's all we had. But the timing was quite interesting. So I'd just left college, and I finally got a job after being on the dole for a while and had access to this incredibly powerful computer system, which was licensed to the BBC. And so me and um, my friend David, we used to use this hardware at night time at the BBC to make uh, on that video for the artificial intelligence. So that video is actually the opposite of that aesthetic. It was kind of quite high end and quite slick. Do you remember what, what was the machine? How did it work? That was a Silicon Graphics Indigo, which cost at the time £80,000, and it was like the size of a fridge freezer. It's huge. Yeah. And we bought it, well, I didn't buy it, but the company I worked for bought it to do some real-time sort of VR, CGI stuff for BBC. And so we used it on a Saturday for their TV show, and then the rest of the week it was not used. You would, like, sneak in at so night? So me and Dave would go in at night and do all this animation stuff for the warp video thing. And you were just teaching yourself? No, no, I'd um, I'd studied too. I'd studied before that and then got this job at this CGI company. Okay. But you were taught how you, I suppose that's my point. It's just like, how on earth do you learn to use something like that? If you're on the dole and you have access to a computer, it's a lot of time available for that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. You have nothing but time. So yeah. you can just work it out. But of course, unfortunately, the dole system doesn't really exist anymore. So yeah. that's not an option for a lot of people. So you were in Sheffield. Were you going out and going to these nights? And oh, yeah, yeah. Music? I mean, it was all um, Forge Masters and LFO and yeah. Nightmares on Wax. Um, I don't know, all those kind of guys. Tough little unit. Oh, what they called Sweet Exorcist, which is Kirk and Malander. Yeah, it's a great time for music. You know, hmm. It's always a great time for music. But that was a particular time of that sort of music, I guess. Did you make music then? Yeah, yeah. No, I've been making music since I was a teenager. In what way? Um, mostly electronic stuff. So when I was 15 or 14, I used to kind of try and build kits from magazines, like ring modulators and crappy filters or synthetic drum things that you strap on the side of your drum kit and it goes, boo, 
like uh, that sort of thing. One of the most amazing ones was a magazine called Electronics and Music Makers, which presumably I don't think exists anymore. They Someone released the circuit and an instructions to build a sampler for the ZX Spectrum. Mm. So ZX Spectrum is a 16K, 2 megahertz computer, I think it was at the time. And it was the most popular computer of, of that year, I suppose, for kids. And um, for about 80 quid, you could buy, well, maybe less than that, I think it was, you buy a couple of analog to digital converters and a few chips and you could build a sampler that could sample one second of sound at eight kilohertz or something, I think it was, mm. which was pretty good. How would you sequence it, though? Uh, well, amazingly, they'd realised that whilst you weren't sampling, you could use the... This is really nerdy, sorry. It's quite that is literally tech. what we're here for. You could use the analog to digital converter, you could use that as a CV input. So you could connect a CV sequencer or keyboard and actually then play the sampler from another source, which is very clever. Yeah, that is clever. It was pretty cool. So, the, And then someone brought out a drum kit system called uh, Spectrum. There we go. Right. Which was a, a really good drum machine, which they'd converted the samples from a Lindrum or the uh, other drum machine of the day. I can't think what it would be converted them to this Spectrum software and you could sequence drum samples. And that was really quite a game changer for making music and stuff. So you had this and you were using it? Yeah, I think I posted, when Clive Sinclair died, I actually posted a picture of it on the Instagram, the OIK Instagram. I think for a lot of people that was quite a, a major moment in accessible mm. technology for, for gear and stuff. Yeah, it's mad. Like, uh, I was just in my brother's shop and he had uh, the Amiga... There was like a little plug-in sampler and it would go in the port. Yep, and it I remember had, that, yeah. And it also like just clearly inside the little cart was all the gubbins and then a DAC and an, an ADC. No, Amiga was very yeah, influential in bedroom music. I think like Black Dog and probably half of all those sort of bands made all their stuff on Amigas, I think. Mm. So you were making music, but what was, what was it? What was the music and what were you doing? Um, I started off wanting to be Stockhausen, I think, when I was about 14. Good so start. I just used old tape recorders and people's beat up hi fires I'd find and try and dub tape to tape to tape. And then yeah. eventually, I think I got a Fostex tape four track, like a really cheap one, and used that to do that sort of thing. I think I then realized my heart wasn't that into that. So I started to try and make music that had rhythm and beats and repeatable measures in it so i think at about 16 my home studio was a homemade spring reverb a homemade gate with this spectrum drum machine and with a gated reverb and a drum machine it sounds like you're very <laughs> contemporary yeah i see what you mean so i played i remember playing the tape to some friends at school and they're like wow you know this sounds like prince or whatever well it didn't it was shit but <laughs> I love it. So you well, you played that you gated the spring. Yeah, and it worked the, yeah. really well. And yeah. it sounded like you know Phil Collins's annoying gated snare drum. Awesome. Off a Spectrum drum machine. So I kind of made bad. I not that bad, but you know not that great. When music. you're 15, you know we can't. You know we're not going to make the greatest music necessarily, but it's it's a start. Yeah, no, it was all right. But did you get you didn't get signed or you didn't? Get, I know I wasn't serious about it. It no. was just a, it was a hobby. It was yeah. Fun. I think I recorded some friends' bands. I was in a covers band, not a covers band. I was in a band that the only good thing we did was covers of uh, Clash songs. Yeah. So I played bass with them for a while, but um, I don't think my heart was in Clash cover songs. But your heart was in like the tinkering, the electronics, the sort of yeah, yeah, no, totally, sort of yeah, of sort of. And then, but you were doing, you were studying film. Was that because film would be? Oh, that was later. This it was a career. This yeah. when you were fifteen, of course. Yeah, and then I got a job. So the final part of that jigsaw was I got a Saturday job with a friend of my dad. So my dad's a jazz piano player, not by not for his career, but as his main interest. And he was in a band with another friend who had his he had an audio company that made and repaired audio gear. So I worked for him as a Saturday job repairing amps and keyboards. So he was a sax player and he had this vision of realising a modular effects system for this, purely for the saxophone, which is rather niche. Yeah, it's very niche. Um, cool. And I worked for him building these things and there was a sort of a pickup and a preamp for the sax and then this floor pedal unit like guitarists would have. And it had an octave divider, an auto wah, which is like a bandpass filter thing, a chorus and a delay or something else. So you could make one sax guy could make himself sound a bit like a sort of brass section with this thing. What was it called? You remember? It was called the Stone Audio something something one. one. I'm yeah. sure it's got a one at the end of it or an X or something. So I'm not sure how many we made, probably not that many, but enough for his family to eat. That's mad. He sadly died last year. Yeah. I was thinking about this the other day. So it's actually quite a cool thing now. If you listen to a lot of this sort of new 
contemporary jazz or experimental crossover stuff, like Sam Gendel, who's an American young sax player. And he does exactly this. He plays his sax into harmonizers yeah. and delays and chorus pedals and all that stuff. And I was thinking, wow, if only this guy had known it was, you know, at least 30 years too early. Yeah. So it's quite an interesting thing. I mean, recently I've been playing with the, I uh, got the Mtron software and that Korg Mod Wave, you know, which is like sample based synth. And my favorite, favorite waveforms are the saxes. Oh, really? I just like su uh... sustained. If you play chords using saxophones, there's a, it just sort of occupies a very satisfying register. And then obviously if you drone basically with that, which is what you probably end up doing if you just stack it with loads of effects. Yeah, they're very rich yeah. um, sounds, aren't they, brass yeah. instruments? I just think it's the sax gets labelled as kind of cheesy, I think. It just it gets well, it's put in a cheesy box. I thought there was a lot of bad sax, wasn't there? <laughs> there it's was a weird, bad sax. You need to do a podcast on why 80s pop records all had sax solos in them. What was that about? I don't know. Like, you know, Big Sax was like, you know, petitioning all the studios and making work for the, the session. Something like that. It does seem very odd in hindsight that they would do that. Like gated reverbs, I guess. There was a, there was just things that everyone was addicted to. And big to. hair. Yeah. Big hair. And I don't know. It just seems very strange. <laughs> but yeah, no, it does. There's some bad sex for sure. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, you went to university, you were in Sheffield. Do you then leave the university and you leave Sheffield and get a job doing something? Well, yeah, I spent a few years on the dole with a mate of mine. We both did the same sort of degree or whatever, and then tried to work our way into Soho doing small jobs on computers. So we had Amigas, in fact. So we yeah. did titles, CGI, you know, clips uh -huh. and things for people's videos. For like TV or just for like little commercials? Music videos, whatever. bits of commercials, TV, just tiny little jobs that were just enough pay your, I don't know, rent or whatever. Did you have a toaster? Video toaster? Yeah. Um, I remember that. No, I remember that being a thing, thing no. that I heard of. I ended up doing this prodigy video with this guy and... Um, they wanted it all CGI, so we spent some money on the Amiga and bought some gear and stuff. Which Prodigy video? Well, it was really funny. So they, it was supposed to be um, the one out in space. I can't remember what it's called. It's got oh. a nice reggae sample about oh, yeah. outer space. I'm going to send them to yeah. outer space. So we spent I'm months animating all this stuff with outer space. And then they decided they weren't going to release that. And they were going to re release the Arthur Brown God of Hellfire oh. sample one instead. So we had to sort of rejig everything we'd done even though it's still got tons of spaceships and stuff. So wait, what, so that if people... So we'd already made the video, basically. Yeah, okay. So you jury-rigged it. Uh, kind of. <laughs> it's very low rent. So if you're talking about low rent CGI, that's very low rent. I mean, it's just on an Amiga, you know. Yeah. But then it's the spirit, right? It's it's not about production values or sort of the No, cost and my name's not in it anyway, so that's oh, fine. Okay. I can I can not live that dream. <laughs> um, so you were doing... You did a video for... Prodigy, that's pretty... Well, I didn't direct it. I just no. helped this guy, the director I knew him. I did all this CGI for him. Very low-rent CGI. Please don't look it up. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I promise I won't. Uh, but then from there, how do you level up? I think I got... Uh, eventually landed this job and then it was this CGI company that had this BBC gig with this big computer. It eventually went bust and then I just ended up being then broke again, which was quite funny. Well, not funny at all, but weird. So hang on, you were working for the BBC... Well, it was a contractor. So this contractor company was a CGI company, contracted out this CGI to the BBC, but eventually they went bust for various reasons. Mm. Uh, but then you're now you're broke again. I suppose my question is, how do you, how have you been able to like live sustainably and actually, you know, find success so that you can then explore your passions and build music gear and, and everything? It's another long story. Do you want to know all the story? It's so you long, can, Jesus. You can um, give us a short version of it. Uh, a friend of mine also lost his job at the same time, and we then decided to set up our own CGI company, which um, sounds incredibly difficult, but it, it isn't because computers at that time made it suddenly accessible. So once PCs and things were fast enough, you could do all that sort of thing. So we had a sort of desktop computer post-production company within a few years, and that was quite popular and successful. Yeah. When, were you doing what commercial things or videos or commercials and music videos and TV items? And from that, I ended up then becoming a director and directing stuff. How do you make that transition? Someone just says, I want you to do the whole video. And then you're like, all right. No, I put together a show reel doing stuff. So once you've got access to that technology, you can make cheap stuff look much better. Yeah. And then get a show reel from that, which looks quite decent. What are your favorite things you've done that like people would have seen or that you're proudest of? 
There's a, a weird Japanese Toyota advert. It uses humans as metaphors or parts of the car, which um, was a weird project. So in Japan, Toyota wanted to win a CAN award every year, but they failed. And they ne- never won one. So CAN has an advertising thing as well as the film thing. Yeah. So every year they tried to do something. So we did a famous VW Golf advert, the da- Dancing in the Rain one. The, and then, David, the David Elsewhere. Exactly that, yeah. Breakdancing, amazing, yep. Fred Astaire's face. And that won an award at Cannes, and then Toyota saw that, so then they thought they might stand a chance if they got these guys to do it. To be clear, you directed that video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then... <laughs> it's super cool. I remember watching that and being like, this is brilliant. As a duo, sorry, it's with yeah, yeah, yeah. Ryoko, I directed with. Of course. Um, and then, so we did this thing for Toyota, which was this strange thing where they... A car it didn't have seats, it had people which were the seats or it had people which were the engine or it was quite funny. It was just reinterpreting all the features of a car but with humans. Yeah. And it did win an award at Cannes and it was really popular and I think that was my favourite one. Yeah, yeah. Because it's funny and quirky and strange. Are you still working in that realm? Like, are you st- Not really, no, yeah. no. So are you just doing modules? Pretty much, yeah. I think the industry's slowly morphed over the time that I was working it into something quite different. In what way? Um, I think, especially in England, there was a lot of um, interest in trying to make something great or award-winning or pushing the boundary a bit. I mean, obviously, they've got to make stuff to sell products, but there was this kind of sense of trying to make something amazing or being better than some other company and advertising agencies. And I think that's sort of, I'm not sure if I say disappeared, but it's certainly been uh, lost a little bit. I think because of the economic climate. Mm. Corporations want to make money and they want to make sure the adverts sell their products. So there's a lot less risk taking. And oh. from that, I think uh, scripts and advertising has become less interesting. Yeah, it's like literally less creative jobs because people are afraid to take risks and do something weird. I think so. I mean, if you read a lot of stories about famous stuff like um, the Guinness advert, so mm. at that time there was these uber famous directors like Jonathan Glazer who were making big dollar adverts and they would really push hard to make something quite unique. Whether it sold lots of Guinness or not, I don't know. Hopefully, I mean, it I still remember that ad very clearly. Yeah. You know, and it, well, it was left field as well. It was like, so it had quite an electronic... I think mean, it was an amazing ad. Yeah, and I think amazing. they pushed so hard. They There was, you know, backhanders and lies and all sorts of things to make right, the right. ads happen. Yeah. Which now people would lose their heads over or lose their jobs or whatever. So yeah, that's changed quite a bit, I think. Did you enjoy your time doing it? Oh yeah. I mean, it's an amazing job to have. It's a very privileged job to have, at the, you know, in that time. So then... Where do we get the person who makes things? Like, so there's, you know, the big product here that made me aware of you was the M185. I first came across it because of the YouTube videos that presumably you had made. Oh, yes, yeah. Which In the uh, corner. It, was it made here in the in that very corner. corner? Oh, my God, I've been <laughs> in the corner, ladies and gentlemen. I have been there. <laughs> because, it, and I'll, I'll introduce how I perceive these. It was that I, And I can't remember how I saw them shared, but I stumbled on them. This was probably... Oh, 14, 10, 12, 13, 14 years ago or something. Um, yeah, it's they, around that time. You had created these little demos that had absolutely no introduction, no, hello, this is Jay, you know, <laughs> hey, this is so-and-so. And you just went into icy, warm, electro funk robotic funk and i can i can literally hear the melodies right now i can yeah, hear i'm them just trying head. to remember that one actually it's quite well on the bum, first bum, one bum, isn't it bum, bum, yeah. bum, bum, bum. Oh, the fact one. of the matter is i can hum you the melody of that you know of a demo you've listened to it too much well but i think it says something and that's also what struck me so profoundly is because you know a good demo it might make you excited functionally about the machine if, if you see, oh, I can do these things, I can see it has potential, but I'm maybe not hearing a brilliant melody. But in that, I could both see the potential and I heard a brilliant melody. You filmed it on what looked like VHS, and the compression was so, like, crazy. It was like a DR110. Yeah, you know, that's the camera, yeah. It's actually a DV camera, that one. But um, I think I credited the camera as the outboard effect because the automatic gain on the levels is just quite... Phenomenal, I think. Tell me the story of how you, I mean, you've told the story and I've told it in a video, but I'd like to hear from you how you came up with the M185. I started to try and do the modular stuff, but um, I really wanted one of those, uh, is it Monomy, the grid sequences? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, and they were probably out of stock or expensive or whatever. And so I never really got around to having one. But when we were working, we did a job for Adidas in China, which was a very, very long job for the Olympics. So we were there for two months or something in Beijing. And in China, they have these crazy um, part, electronic parts shops that are like um, shopping centers, mm. like four or five floors or whatever, huge places. And they have loads and loads of little units where guys are selling components. And obviously most of it's all semiconductors and stuff. But I found this one place that had these crazy switches, the eight-way slide switches. So I bought a bag of those and then sort of thought about how unusual they are because you don't see them here in Europe or whatever. Um, and then on the, on the plane on the way back, after watching the YMO video of them demonstrating, the, is it the Moog 960, yeah, the sequencer? Yeah, it is, yeah. So I think they're programming Rydeen in the studio for, for some TV interview. And I realized that it's a sequencer, it's a step, um, what, what is it step sequencer you call those ones, analog yeah. sequencers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they normally just do one note per part and they just go, doodly 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 doodly, you know, every single note. No stopping. Well, they're skipping. But well, that one had a skip on it. Yeah. I thought, oh, that's really unique, you know. Mm. And, um and I think I wanted to do that. And I thought, well, maybe I could use these switches to make that skip sort of repeat function mm. rather than just skipping a node or whatever. So it came from those switches. And I think on the plane, I started doing little drawings and doodles in the sketchbook about it. I think by that time, I'd already made an analog sequencer from some kit somewhere, mm. which just ran through the, the notes over and over again. And it drove me nuts because I just didn't like that repetitiveness. Yeah, yeah. I think at the time I mentioned to you about it, it's like Tangerine Dream. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of Tangerine Dream, or I was, the early stuff, but they do have that Berlin sequence where it just repeats over and over again the same 16 notes. It's relentless. I mean, yeah. it's, it's hypnotic and I do love it, but I know what you mean. There's something about a, a, stop, a break. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it works repeat. in a Michael Mann film, like Thief, is it, they use it in or whatever, when it's tense and it's like goes on for three minutes, but I don't know. Anyway, so I wanted to get around that and do that step repeat thing. And the switch was the gateway to that happening. I, I love it. I love that it's the technology or even just like a glimmer of just a part can inspire the product. I guess it's not how I think people come up with stuff. I think in my mind, I'm like, you have an idea, but actually you can just look at a bag of parts and be like, well, I know what I could do with this like a chef. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's not... Often that happens, I guess, but that is a thing. If you look at famous synth circuits and things that involve analog electronics, a lot of those are using the sort of strange characteristics of components to do what they do. Yes, yes, um, yes. So it's not exactly the same, but a lot of it, someone's going to look at a... I'm sure Robert Moog looked at the transistor and realised you put two transistors together, you can make this um, exponential current converter, which is the basis for all oscillator um, CV volt input things. You know, he knew what he was doing, but mm. he knew that that part would be able to do that by doing it, using it a certain way. Not that I'm like him or anything like that. But, no, but I know what you mean. And yeah. it's like also like op amps and the so they have unique have personalities, personalities, yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. And so you do exploit them. I was thinking about this other day. It's a bit like sound. Like if you're a musician, sounds inspire a music in a certain respect. Absolutely. So you go through some presets on a synth or something, and certain sounds are going to make you want to make something or make something in a certain way. That's literally how I make music. Is yeah, I'm inspired totally. by the sound first. So that's not so different in a way, no, I think. No, it's not. Tell me about your love affair with the System 100M, because that's you've got, I, I can tell the I've, our listeners here that I've, been in the room with the corners and <laughs> you've got three system 100m cabinets um and well there's a fourth one hidden is somewhere. there yeah there's a, but a, it doesn't have the size it's used for calibrating yeah so it's just used as a power block how did that begin and why do you have that system i think it's from when i was a teenager i used to go to the music shops i had no money to buy anything but i used to always take the leaflets yeah. So there's a, um, an issue of Roland's catalogue or leaflet thing that they did whenever it would be 80-something. Uh, God, I'm old. Don't even remember. No, no, no. But I've, I've, I've lusted over these 85, leaflets. 85, 86. Subsequently, not at the time because I was a tiny little toddler, but like the catalogues with the beautiful photography yeah. of, of like all of the Roland's later. And it has all the gear in there, yeah. 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 So I used to pick up these leaflets and sit at home and think, wow, these are great, or, and draw them. I'd do sketches of them or yeah. imagine these things. And all I had was this cardboard box of the ring modulator. I think it was a, and something, I don't know, a filter or something. Mm. So I could kind of pretend I had this sort of gear, of but obviously nowhere near it. But then I think as an adult now with a job, then I could actually afford to buy one eventually. So I bought one. When did you buy it first? 2000. 
2007, 2006, maybe mm. something like that. Yeah, I bought a rack in Japan, but weirdly, it was one of the super rare ones that has the. I should know the numbers. I can't see it from here. One one tens is it? it was just all one one tens, I think, which is an unusual set. So I bought that one, I think, and shipped it over in a duvet <laughs> to protect it. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, was it fine? Pretty much. It's a little rusty, but uh, you showed me one of the modules. They've got like they're not like Euro modules, and they've actually got like a chassis around the actual module themselves. They yeah, feel very robust. metal enclosure behind them. Yeah, which is a bit for noise. EMF and noise and all the rest of it. It's a shielding te- yeah. te- technique. But the boards are big in those. They have a big board which runs perpendicular to the faceplate. So they're based very loosely on the 700, which has the same layout with the board. Yeah. But the 700, didn't, I don't think, had the cases, the metal boxes. Does it sound different, the 700? The oscillators are s- the same, roughly. The filters are completely different. How do you describe the filters in the 100M? Are they are they like the 101? Is it the, the 3109 chip or is it something different? No, no, no. It uses the BAT6610 or whatever it's called. Oh, yeah. I need to know my numbers here. Well, this is going to be transmitted the point is it, globally, you know, isn't it? You're not, I don't think anyone's... A BA, sorry, BA6610 or something. It's yeah. the famous OGA chip by Roland. But then is it discrete? It's not like an all-in-one chip that's doing a filter. Uh, no, they're OGA, so they're, that which stands for... Transductance amplifier, is it? Operational. Control, yeah. Is it? Wait, so it basically wait. is a controlled current, sorry. It controls the um, level of the signal and they're the building blocks for the filters. So I think there's four per filter, so they're four pole. Um, I, I don't filters. know them. I've never, like, I played, well, I played with the System 100M once. Well, let's get I, in there later, but they're pretty strong. They're 24 dB low pass yeah. heavyweight things. I, in my mind, I actually played one at Turnkey, which yep. you would we would know and like have been into. Wow, but I used to work there. Uh, wow, and, yeah. even more wow. Yeah, yeah, wow, well, 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 not wasn't that wow. <laughs> it wasn't a wow experience. Okay, well, I met, I made lots of friends. It was it was informative, but I wouldn't say it was a brilliant place to okay. work. Okay, but they had they had this like museum. People who had been in London in the the nineties who were into music would have probably have ended up there down in the basement. Oh, yeah, they had a whole they had system, that, didn't yeah, they? They had yeah. that they had like sort of sample stations where you could listen to sample CDs. It was very much uh, of an era. And then they had these vintage synths and they had like a Waldorf Wave. Uh they had oh, I'm trying to remember. I can't remember all the other ones. But they had I remember the some of the formative ones were the MKS no they had an MKS eighty and they had the the PG eight hundred for it. Is it? I think it's PJ800. And I remember trying that and being absolutely like blown away by how good it sounded. And I don't know which, there's a, a nerdy thing about the rev on MKS 80s. Like there's two filter. There's a yeah, filter they spot the design, didn't they? They did. But they're nothing like the 100M, those ones. No. Because um, they're the field design chip ones. But they had a 100M. And I remember trying it and I remember just thinking, this just sounds fantastic. <laughs> it's just fantastic. Oh, well, there you go. You were saying that the, the size was one of the appeals to you. Uh, yeah, the ergonomics. I guess probably I didn't know about Eurac if, anyway, so I bought the Rolands and I had that long-standing interest of them since I was a kid. But um, I think the ergonomics are perfect because they're just about the right size. Mm. Because they're that big, they allow attenuators for every CV yeah. connector. yeah which in Eurorack is quite a luxury. Um, I mean, we try and put them in on our modules, but you can't do it on everything. So I just look at one now. We don't. Yeah, yeah. The latest module doesn't have that many, sorry. But yeah, I think it's just a really good balance between size and usability, the mm. 100M. So were you making music with these? Or was it, again, or was it just like fun? It was like... Uh, I did, like, and then I couldn't it. resist taking them apart. So then I bought oh. another rack, which was its useless modules. It was all VCAs. I can't remember why I bought that rack. I think I had a mixer in it. It was like four VCAs, which I didn't want, and uh, dual VCAs, so whatever that is, eight. And then uh, the mixer, which is really useful the voltage mixer. Mm. So I took apart the VCAs and took out everything out of them and then put loads of um, clock uh, dividers, so essentially um, binary counter chips. They were sort of rudimentary sequences, so you would put a clock source in there and you'd get subdivisions of even numbers out of one of them. And did you, well, this was a DIY thing you made? A- I was just a whole load of spaghetti, spaghetti inside a box, yeah. yeah. So just so then I could expand my... 100M range. (laughs) But how did you actually give it a panel and where is it? Yeah, because the VCAs are useless. I didn't, well, they're not, unless you need one. So I didn't need them. So I took out the insides and just put the spaghetti wiring 
clock divider madness inside. It's like relabel the VCA controls and stuff. How did you make it usable? Just no, I don't know. I don't think I even labeled it. I just used all the jack sockets and the sliders. Yeah. So I think that was what it was. The sliders were, were then used to mix together the different multiples of clocks and things. That sounds quite good. I actually have to backtrack because now I'm trying to remember the history. I bought an MC4B before I bought the 100M. Yeah. The which is the sequencer. Yeah. I think because um, I really like the look of that. And oh, for some reason, I bought it without it? owning any synthesizers, <laughs> which was hilarious. I listened to the clicks of it. Fantastic. Listen to the, the clicking of the gate noises on it and borrowed like a 101 from a okay. friend just to make sure it worked. So I think that's, and then I bought the 100M because I needed oh. to connect to the sequencer too. Okay, so at some point you were just like, well, I've got to begin my like Roland catalog circa 1981 Odyssey. But it was so cheap. I think it was like £75 pounds or something. Oh so I thought, I need to get that. It looks so cool. I don't know what they go for now, but in a way I can't A bit imagine. more, I think. But I can't imagine they're that expensive because they're such pigs in their own, like, you know, it's calculator entry. Yeah, they're not fun to program. No. But it's a nice object. Wasn't it like, um, oh, who was it who used those? But like, you know, it's like s- some old band. But George so- Moroder's, yeah. I mean, he used the 8 quite a bit, MC8. They and had- YMO used MC8 and MC4. Um, most of most pop records use them in the early eighties. Exactly. And there were, but I remember Human reading League. there was like an MC4 programmer. There was like someone whose job oh, it yeah, was no, just to know how the the dance worked. In the worked. golden age of pop music, there was programmers for everything. The guy yeah. would program your drum machines. There was a guy that programmed your fair lights. It was yeah. there was even an agency. So you know, um, Jill Sinclair, who was Trevor Horn's wife. Right. Yeah. So um, her family owned Psalm Studios. That's what her main thing was. But she also set up an agency of programmers in the eighties. Of guys that they would, you know, be hired out to go and program your sequences right. or your what a luxury that even we, your DX7, you know, yeah. you say, oh, I need to make this noise, and they'll come along and program something for you. I mean, that's a rare beast. Who knows how to do that? Well, you have a DX7 too, in there. Well, I got a few FMs. I got the twenty something, the the four up one. I kind of prefer that in a way, the gritty. Do you mean the four up? Oh, you got a DX twenty one. It's four up, and, and they, a DX really hundred f- as well, which I really like. Yeah, yeah, they're the fuzzy, crusty. Yeah. I like those too. So I, I kind of like that for the sound, but also the fact that it's a lot quicker to program. Yeah. So I don't mind programming either of them, but it's just the, the seven, it's going to take whatever two to the power of whatever it is, is a lot more time to program. He's got so many more operators. And that's another thing I think worth highlighting is that you, and certainly with your vector wave, is that you're not strictly analog. You also seem to embrace the digital fuzz and fizz, you know, that kind of maelstrom of weirdness that FM can create. Yeah, I think it's um, slightly a zeitgeisty thing. A few years ago, I think suddenly there was this sort of early digital nostalgia thing that kind of crept up everywhere. And having the DX keyboards, I got, I think I brought my, is it the 21? I'm, I should know these things. It's the four up, uh, well, it's stereo and it has like, you can do two bangs. DX21 is definitely like, I think that's the, the full size. It's noisy as hell and clunky, it? yeah. It's effectively a DX100 with four yeah. size keys. And- so that I bought off some X Ravers in Bethnal Green. It's really? kind of half broken, but I really liked it. And it sort of inspired that early digital nostalgia. Mm. So it was kind of came from that. And I think it's, there's only so many subtractive oscillator filtery things you can do. It's, sometimes it's interesting to look for something else sonically i think do you actually program the dx are you, do you yeah program? yeah i love yeah. them yeah they're really nice what sort of stuff do you make on them um wobbly things that don't try and sound like uh whatever that electric piano n- noise was that they're famous for yeah or the lately bass or those other shitty things yeah. well i mean i like lately bass, Sorry. but no no but i know what you mean i do know what you mean uh yeah they're quite actually really Easy to make sound like wobbly pads, cord pad mm. machines, yes. you know. Yes. And shimmery and wonky, you know. For pads especially. Everyone thinks, like oh, Boards of Canada, it's so analogue and everything, but you can easily make that sort of nice, warm, wobbly sounds on a DX. My favourite Aphex pads are two operator FM. Oh, there we yeah. are. It's just dead simple. And he's the band. Then. And that would be done on a DX100. He actually posted like his receipt for the DX100 that he bought in whenever. 86 or 87. I think mine's still got the sticker from that exchange shop in Notting Hill. Does that still exist? You know, they used to sell gear. No, I don't know that one. Uh, Probably not. But he did a great thing with the FM when he did um, Window Licker. So the opening melody of that is some fantastic FM sound. I would sing it, but I can't sing, so... Yeah. You'll have to sing it for me, Alex. Okay, well, I'll have to do that. I'll dub that in. That's a lovely uh, bit of FM on that. So M185, was that like the first kind of quote-unquote 
polished proper thing that you'd made you know if you've made a weird like vca hacked no no i'd done uh that was a third product i think there was a proper 16 step sequencer in the road and format which was just those all the notes we should have a name for these sequences what are they all the notes the all the notes all the ones. notes ones yes that go on and on and on infinitely uh there was that i think i made two of them or something and then there was um the Vactrol resonator, which I think I made a total of four or three or something, um, which is three bandpass filters using Vactrols. Yeah, nice. Which I then relaunched last year again, which is the 175. So they were before the 185, actually, originally. And the 185, I remember it was like on the Electro Music Forum, wasn't it? That it was. Yes, so I made it a, a kit so everyone could buy this tiny PCB and a chip and spend hours with spaghetti wiring trying to make it work. All that point to point wire. There's not like a PCB behind them. No, it's very cruel, actually. I should have realized early on that that was not a fun thing to make for people. I mean, it sold, I sold loads of them. It was very popular, but um, uh, I'm not sure how many people actually finished making them. Ah. I remember Matthew, ALM Matthew mentioned it recently that he had one, but he wasn't sure he ever got it working. Oh, no. So I feel slightly guilty now. I feel like uh, this is a good time to mention. I mean, I was t telling you about James Blake the other day, but... Uh, yes, yeah. I said this recently on another podcast, but... It was very, very novel to hear an M185, unmistakably M185 passage on a charting album. You know, the da 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 <laughs> which is, that's my impression of the riff from James Blake's record. I mean, it's done on an Intelligent Metropolis, but nonetheless, it is your idea that is, you know, oh. from that switch... To you know, in a in a market, well, there we to, go. to to a record, you know, and it's and it's unmistakable. It can only be done on that sequencer. Well, that's nice to hear. It's have you have you uh, spoke to him to make sure that this, this is true? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I have, and ah. it is. Um, I mean, he's on record. If you go and listen to the the Tape Notes podcast, there's like a brilliant, brilliant podcast. How he talks about the making of. He talks about ah. the making, and he literally talks. It's like you know, I did a big, big, big long jam, and you can hear, and he actually plays it in the thing. It's like you know, twenty five minutes of oh, just lovely. messing around with the switches and the fade, you know, finding the riff, and then there's just one golden bit where he's like, and. Then I heard this and I was like, oh, that's it. That's uh, the one. And then he sliced that up and that becomes the record. That's interesting. I guess it's a particular way of using it, isn't it? Or playing with it. Jamming, you mean? Or, yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I, when I first built it, I used to try and program in a Herbie Hancock bass line or, mm. or some 70s funk bass line and then run out of notes no, or no, switches no, or whatever. Yeah, stages. But then, of course, I'd find that, well, the notes are really great, but it's... You can play with the rhythm once you have the notes. Yeah. And you can kind of jam around that harmonic structure. And it's really interesting that just altering the rhythm, how it changes. Exactly. And it's really hard to do that with the infinite blippy bloppy sequencer. You can't, yeah. Sh moving the notes means finding that note on another knob again. You know, yeah. Which is hard to do on an analog sequencer, potentially. Oh, they are. But I just think, you know, it, it, it has been a wildly successful design and it's um yeah it's, it's just amazing it's just a good example of like electronic music is the kind of tinkerer the tinkerer can make something and can release it and it can have a real impact it's 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 not it's not like in the car industry you can just have like one tinkerer that can that can change the sort of or maybe you can to some degree but i think the whole of modular is a bit like that though Obviously, uh, the sequence is lovely and nice and everything, but I think the whole modular environment's like that, isn't it? You can plug the wrong thing into the wrong thing and r discover something that you hadn't thought would happen. Or mm. it's, That's what it's about, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Endless inspiration and fun. Yeah. And so then you were doing System 100M modules, but then you did do Eurorack. And so why did you do Eurorack? And then how do you make modules these days? Well, the jump to Eurorack, you mm. mean? It's funny, actually, it came about from uh, my son's school. Um, so I had a, a son, um, and I took a tote bag to the school playground once with some coffee and I'd bought or something. And some guy came up to me and he said, oh, teenage engineering. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know. He said, oh, are you into synths? I said, yeah, kind of. So we got talking. This is James, by the way. Hi, James. I told him what I did. And he's like, oh, my God, I've heard of you. I saw, you know, Milo Melody's video, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Amazing. So thanks for that, um, Alex. <laughs> and thanks to James. So then I got to know this guy, this lovely guy, James, who's now a friend of mine. And um, he said, oh, you should see, you know, check out this Eurorack thing. You know, it's really big because he was into it. And so he kept pushing me and convinced me to, to do something in Eurorack. So mm. thanks very much to James to 
I think I'm pushing in that direction. I I met someone who at an event in East London that we did, and someone came in and was like, "I've met Jake." Uh, Yeah, yeah, he wears baseball hats like all men of a certain age. Yeah, exactly. We're all wearing baseball hats. Uh, (laughs) No, he's a lovely guy. So he's really into modular, and he kind of got me convinced that I should try and do something in Eurac. So. That's how it came about. So you did like, well, you did the 185 in the, you know, this beautiful kind of black. It had different, you, you had to find an aesthetic. You've got a very like nice, like I can see Matthew from ALM likes the modules because he's. Does he? Know, well, I think Is that he official? Did. Well, I mean, I, I just, uh, I've seen, you know, I've been there <laughs> Thank you, talking to you and Matthew wa- like wanders over and oh. like, he's like, that's cool. You know, and it's it's because I I think you've got a really nice sense of design. There's like a really beautiful aesthetic. Thank to, you to these. Well, my dad's a graphic designer, so I grew up staring at um, Letraset catalogues and yeah. Creative Review was a big influence. Actually, I'm not sure if it's still going, but it was a big thing before the internet, which is a design magazine that showcased all the latest design in graphics and advertising and a bit of photography. So I kind of grew up with a awareness of design. Mm. But the 185, I mean, it really is a bit form, is it form follows function? In a way, it's kind of the structure of all the features sort of inspired its layout, really. And I quite like the idea of black. I read somewhere, someone had a great handle on an Instagram or something years ago that was black knobs with black lettering on a black panel or something. And I thought, yes, that's what I want. <laughs> so I think that was a, I was just... I mean, you at, have actually you know, got white lettering, but like... I know. Sorry, guys. But, I mean, the next one would be invisible. Well, actually, the M185 does just have, like, unlabeled coloured buttons on it, doesn't it? Yeah, I only, only realised that kind of recently, actually, because I saw someone else's rig and they had the 185 and they put stickers underneath the buttons. Mm-hmm. Well, a few people do, actually. I think one of them had the start-stop labelling, another just had coloured stickers under the buttons, which I thought, how would a colour-coded sticker telling you about a coloured button mean something? I'm not sure what that meant to that person. I mean, but I quite liked it anyway. I think I didn't. I complain that you had unlabeled something on your uh, new simpler vector wave. Uh, yeah, all in fact. So there's a secret module which you can't uh, call the vector wave. What did you call it? Sorry, I think I called it the simpler vector wave. The simpler vector wave, vector light. We could the call vector, it vector light. Yeah, um, vector L. Yeah, no, entirely. Would you say a third of that is unlabeled or two thirds? It's yeah. quite a lot of it's unlabeled. Yeah, it is. That's really going to upset you some could, people. I then. mean, but then is that thing of isn't the spirit of modular just turning a knob and seeing what happens? Well, that was my thought. Yeah, I think because you don't label a well, I suppose you label a cutoff frequency knob, but you don't label it to say this is the good bit, do you? No. So you actually use your ears, don't you? Or the frequency of an oscillator. You don't have a whole load of labels around like this is the base bit. This is good for keys or whatever do you yeah no you have numbers sometimes but i know what you mean yeah i was talking to tom whitwell yesterday and mm. he was talking about a, he used a phrase that i'd not really thought about but it was well i think i'm getting it right it was like hierarchy and he was saying that the size of the knobs and their placement from top to bottom dictates their importance yeah yeah user. and i'd not really thought about that no that's true i think in, in good design so on the new thing that we were just talking about one of the knobs is, in, is actually grown in size because it used to be a little stick attenuator but um i realized it's the equivalent of the cutoff frequency for all the guys that like to oh yeah it's important. do that thing so you've actually made it bigger so it's now bigger because oh, that's the one that encourages the twiddling i think <laughs> uh, that's the one that will be worn away like on a three or three. Yeah, quite possibly, yeah. So um, how are you, right now, I mean, I've seen it, you, you have literally got over to the side of us, like a desk where you make the modules here. You're not like, you don't have contractors or you just literally order it yourself. How does it work? How do you make these um, things? The service mount assembly is done with a contracting company. There's another company that started doing the through-hole stuff. I actually know the same company that's now doing the service mount also do the through-hole stuff like Jack's mm. on some of the modules. We have a lovely chap called Patrick who does the sequences. He does all the switch assembly on those. So you get them partially assembled. Yeah, so that's service mount assembled in a factory and then he does the, the through-hole stuff on those, which um, I think drives him somewhere crazy, but after he's done a 50 or so, he gets into the zone, he tells me, and after that he's kind of floating, I think. Yeah. In case you're not aware, so the 185 has 256 solder points oh. just for the slider switches. Oh, um, that's a lot, right? 
Yeah, and there's the, they're quite tightly packed in, so I think he gets definitely in the zone with that, I think. And then, are you doing the coding? How do you code the, these are like DSP modules? How are you doing that? Um, yeah, I do all the coding as well. The sequences are quite a simple microchip, PIC chip, they're called which is an 8-bit microcontroller, which insanely I decided I'd use and write an assembly, which is the sort of hardware of doing things. What I understand of programming is you write a, a sort of in a simplified human-readable language and it is turned into, like, assembly code. Yeah, roughly. Right? So you, get, I mean, you have an interpreter. So most people use C or C++, which is a, a high-level language, yeah. which looks a bit like English, and then that gets compiled and turned into an assembled uh, machine code program. Hang on. You wrote it just at the low level? The Hang sequencer, on. yeah. Well, originally it was because I wanted speed, so the latency of clock inputs yeah. and clock and gate outputs I wanted to have so as tight as possible. You wanted Amiga tightness and Atari tightness. Yeah, pretty much. And it was, I mean, that was designed a while ago, so the best way to do that was to write it in an assembler. But I used to do that as a teenager. So all this stuff with the Spectrum, I was doing machine code programming on Spectrums years and years ago. So it's not that different. But of course, when you're dealing with things like sequences and MIDI and uh, quantize pitch and all that stu- stuff, it becomes quite hardcore. I read recently that legendarily Theme Park was written in machine code or whatever. It was yeah, written- I mean, all games used to be, yeah. I mean, but Theme Park is a hugely complex... Is that mid-90s? When is that made? Yeah, I think so. Wow. And it's like the whole, you know, it's a park simulator. Think of all the systems <laughs> and all of the things. It's like it's like counting every grain of sand on a beach. Yeah. I'm just like in awe that that's how it was. And that's why it ran really well on all these systems. And it was like a, a technological marvel. And the guy made loads of money. But I'm just like, how did you... How are you doing this? It's, yeah, it's just a lot hardcore. So even just multiplying numbers is quite a slog. And that also the 185 has a connection where you can join two together. Yeah. So you can slave two together and do 16 stages. So the communication on that was quite a lot of fun programming in, in machine code assembler. So you don't do that for the complex physics? No, the well, they need a lot more oomph and they all run in 32-bit numbers, which is obviously not very much fun if it's all 8-bit registers. So yeah, they're all programmed in C, those ones. Okay. Uh, what is the future of music technology? Ooh. I think just it's diverging in all sorts of ways. That There isn't any one future, is there? Well, I think that's okay. Yeah. I yeah. think it's okay to be your personal, your own personal journey. Well, I think it's two things. I really like that electroacoustic thing, which has probably never gone away, but it kind of surfaces occasionally where people are using mechanical and electronic things yeah. combined. One of my favourite instruments is the, um, I was going to say the Fender Rhodes, but I actually prefer the Wurlitzer version. Yeah. And that's a great example of electromechanical stuff using pickups on what's essentially as a glockenspiel to try and make something sound like a piano, which it doesn't. I yeah. really like that instrument. But um, the reverse of that, you know, using pickups and sending stuff to pickups is really interesting. I don't know if that's particularly current or futuristic, but it's a thing that I really like. Well, I think there's, yeah, you're right. There's, with this very, very simple thing, you could probably get all manner of complex tone not tone Yeah, artists. but it's a bit like Tom's got that wonderful uh, piezo trigger thing, you know, mm. and you're on paper, it's like, well, that's so simple, but it's actually very subtle, the amount of variations to the tactile element can produce in the way the voltage outputs are on these. Well, and then when you run it through the mutable instruments approach is you run it through a a resonator or an exciter and from it. it Well, it's that whole thing like a even tied harmonizer, isn't it? You can put a lot of things into that and you get something amazing out of it. Yeah. With its, you know, pitch shifted reverb or whatever. I got a book actually last, uh, actually not last year, last last year, which is wonderful book about vintage studio technology and it has great interviews with Greisinger and all the oh, yeah. even type guys people. yeah and that was really interesting to read about because they were had very restricted power available to them to create these these things they were making so that was a really interesting book to read but i mean you're making me think of a, a recent thing i got a nord lead too and it sounds amazing and it, it too, you know, it has a Motorola chip that is much more powerful than those those processes and the old reverbs would be. But but it is a relatively restricted, pretty low power CPU in any modern standard. But the what the Nord creates, I think, sounds amazing. I just think yeah. it sounds really good. And it and it shows that But there's a danger to capitalism, isn't it? Capitalism's all about 
saying that these new ones are better. Of course. So there's a, th- a reason why things are what they are. Although it's what? like the tape recorder. So I had to put a new drive belt in this Tascam eight track thing in, in the corner studio. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, just to test it, I put some tapes on. It's like, wow, they do sound very punchy and amazing and, you know, full of dynamic range. It's not so shitty as I remember. So, um, yeah, it's not always about new stuff, is it? Discovering the old has some value too. But then eBay realises that and makes everything expensive. Well, then you just have to, like, make your own weird version of it, right? Well, that's I think that's the Eurorack thing, isn't it? It's people saying, oh, I kind of want that, but I'm going to make my own version. Yeah. It certainly was a bit for me, but I think that's the great thing about it, isn't it? Well, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for chatting, letting me chat. Thank you. Interesting. An electromechanical doodad. Yes, returning again to the thought of passions. Follow them, friend. If you are interested to make something, make it. If you like rummaging through bins and can see, can find some interesting parts and can think, oh, maybe I could hack something together, do it. Do it. Stop talking about it and do it. I think this may be the moral is that you should always indulge your passions if you can you know if time and money permits but mainly time i realize you know when you're young you've got nothing but it but when you're older and you've got kids very hard to find the time so my hat will go off to anyone who has a busy family and is trying to to indulge new passions it's really hard but let jake's story be a great example If you're just interested and and passionate and, you know, you indulge those childish fantasies of I wanted synths, I wanted to have this amazing setup that's in a catalogue and I've got a bit of money now, I'm an adult, then by golly, I'm going to have it. I'm going to buy that toy now. And I think of my dear brother, Matt, who uh, during lockdown uh, got into buying arcade machines uh, and every console that he'd always wanted as a 15 year old but could not afford and so much so that you know he's he's so easily influenced that i was saying to him i was like matt you know you always had a mega drive and you know i always wanted the 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 mega cd that big chunky wide mega cd that was designed to go under the mega drive and i was talking to about it one night and then he just went off and and then just quietly, a few days later, intimated that he had one now. And he'd simply, got, he was so inspired by my passion that he'd gone and indulged it and bought one almost for me, but for his Mega Drive, which was the Mega Drive that inspired us all when we were kids. It was his, it's his old OG unit. And I bring up this and that as examples that you follow passions. Matt's mad arcade passion a thing that we all thought was just like why are you buying arcade machines you absolute lunatic they are massive well matt has opened a shop and in his shop are the arcade machines so it's sort of a shop in an arcade so fair enough you know uh you like followed them you loved them you decided to buy them and now you've like gone well i can open one an arcade sort of now uh, so I have, which has Tempest. That will be Jake's favourite game in there. Um, although the Tempest is tempestuous and often doesn't work. So if you go and it doesn't work, you can I can apologise in, in advance. But his shop is called WSA. WSA, when spaceships appear in North London. And I bring up this and that as examples. That you just, you should follow your passions. If there's some weird thing you always wished you had that's within reach now you just forgot about it well what is it you know is it a system 100m is it a hornby train set man i wanted the badass i wanted a really badass hornby train set i remember like pouring over the catalogs and i remember the thing that always like that like 
made my heart flutter was seeing the light lights inside the buildings and coming out of the trains. They were darkly lit, like photography that they had, and the, the, the trains would light up, you know, just the lights. There was something about seeing that there were actual real lights inside that made it feel real and special and magical to me. It was so dramatically lit. Loved those old catalogues. Um, whatever it is, you should follow it because you really don't know what can come from it. And I, I definitely can say that the quote-unquote career that I have had in this industry, that is to say that I used to work at Turnkey, as we talked about. That was the first job that I had out of university. And it was because I was interested in music technology and I'd, I'd bought stuff and I was trying to like consume everything I could about it. And I loved it. And I thought I could turn that passion into a job. And it did work. I did. Like, you know, everyone who worked there was passionate about music gear. They loved the stuff. They weren't just there because it could have they'd have gone happily to any other place. They wanted to be there because they loved the things that were in there. They loved the gear. And when I was there, I got the opportunity to play with the System 100M because I was so vocal about my interest in synths and the vintage gear. And the moment that there was a hint that we could get our hands on the sort of museum, which they were actually decommissioning at the time when, when I was there in like 2006. Well, you know, I got the chance. They were like, yeah, all right, you can go. And, Alex, you understand it. You can go and like try out the System 100M. And I can't, I think it was like testing it and seeing if it worked, you know, because I'd, I'd been buying stuff I, I had since I, in fact I had a Schwemann S1 at the time and I had the Schwemann S1 a thing I could only have afforded because I took the money that my grandparents had saved for me to buy a car with and I spent it all on that synthesizer I spent all the money that my grandparents gave me to buy a car with and I spent it on a synth you know which is the I think that is actually the Hans <laughs> Zimmer quote isn't it I still don't drive. <laughs> well, I do drive, uh, but uh, yeah. My point here is you should not be ashamed or um, in any doubt that you ought to indulge your crazy fantasies, whatever they may be, and follow your passions. Follow your passions. Indulge them. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? As long as your passions are generally considered, uh, you know, they, they don't hurt other people. <laughs> That's the main point. So, Jake, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for making me lots of coffees with your EK43 grinder uh, that you have. There's another passion. I like coffee, uh, to quote Jake, who is in a video that I released recently, uh, which is a fun one. So if you'd like to hear more, um, I can link to you. The video but that has jake in it we have a patreon please consider sponsoring on patreon which you can do for as little as i think about three pound fifty a month or whatevs it's the cost of a coffee the cost of a coffee uh, but not necessarily a cost of coffee and at least not one from a service station um but you know a high street one um you can help support the production of episodes future episodes and videos so please do consider that if you can, patreon.com forward slash Milo Melodies, or please share the episode. Just tell your friends and share. That is also, that's actually like an amazing way of helping because it's free um, and it tells other people, why is it worth listening to? It will help me grow. So thank you. Thank you to our sponsors, Signal Sounds and thunk.co.uk. And we'll be back very soon with another bleep. That's it. Thanks very much. And we'll see you next time.